I'd like to introduce our speaker, Elaine Mills. Elaine is a member of the Master Gardener class of 2012, and her primary interest is in sustainable gardening and native plants. She created the first set of fact sheets on tried and true native plants that are a popular resource on our website. She has spent many years uh, photographing native plants, both in public and private gardens, and enjoys selecting photos from her library to illustrate her talks, articles, and weekly educational posts. And you can see a lot of these beautiful pictures right on this slide here. She also is, uh, serves as a coordinator for one of our demonstration gardens at the uh, Glen Carlin Demonstration Garden. And I'd like very much now to introduce Elaine. Thank you very much, Colleen. And thanks also to Julie, who's supporting behind the scenes. This April marks the 150th anniversary of the very first Arbor Day, which was held in 1872. Uh, and it, at that time, one million trees were planted in the state of Nebraska. That means that it's the perfect occasion for talking about the importance of planting trees. And I'd also like to go into a little bit more detail about why we would like to support native species of trees in our natural areas and to consider choosing them uh, for planting in our public areas and our home landscapes where possible. I'll be talking about details on 20 native trees, discussing their characteristics and attributes, a little bit about their care and uh, information on their landscape uses. And I'll conclude with some general care information and some resources. Trees uh, are very important because of what we refer to as ecosystem services, services they provide for the environment. And on this first slide, you'll see services provided just by the foliage alone. Trees really act as the lungs of our planet. They're taking in carbon dioxide and providing oxygen for us to breathe as a byproduct of photosynthesis. They play a very important role in our water cycle, distributing water into the atmosphere through the process of transpiration. They also muffle noise. Tree foliage can buffer the impact of rainfall on the ground. With some of the heavy storm events we're experiencing these days, rain can hit the ground directly at about 20 miles an hour. So the tree foliage can, can help buffer that. Trees also provide shade, relief from the heat and the sun in the summer. In our urban areas where there is um, a great deal of paved surfaces, trees can uh, help reduce what's referred to as the heat island effect. Trees also take up greenhouse gases. These include uh, ozone, nitrous oxide, carbon monoxide, and they also filter out particulates from the air. And finally, deciduous trees help recycle nutrients when the leaves fall and then are saved that those nutrients go back, can be taken back up for the trees and other plants. Trees are also important because of their root systems. They have intimate relationships with microorganisms in the soil, the fungi and bacteria. And the fungi in particular have um, a particular relationship. They will form long strands, long networks referred to as mycorrhizae. These help the tree to take up nutrients and water. They also protect the tree from some pathogens. And these networks actually reach between trees of the same and different species. And they uh, help to connect the soil. Uh, the root systems of trees also help to filter and clean our water. Strong root systems can prevent erosion. And in addition, the roots as well as the main body of the tree sequester carbon. Trees add beauty to our landscapes with their beautiful spring flowers, interesting foliage and fall color and uh, unusual bark. Trees can increase property value up to about 19%. That is because they provide privacy 
if trees are sited properly, they can actually provide great energy savings. Deciduous trees planted close to a house can shade it and reduce a cooling cost 20 to 30%. And evergreen trees can act as a windbreak in the wintertime, uh, reducing heating costs. Trees are also seen as creating sociable neighborhoods. And finally, trees also support our health. We've all heard about a forest bathing. And this is something that happens because of the release of essential oils referred to as phytoncides into the atmosphere. And those phytoncides can help improve immune response, decrease inflammation, actually create a sense of calm, thereby reducing cortisol levels. And there have been studies uh, conducted just of views of trees in a hospital. There was one study conducted jointly by the Nature Conservancy, the National Institutes of Health, and the University of Louisville. And they demonstrated that uh, patients recovered more quickly from both illness and surgery when their rooms had views of trees. Uh, I'd like to talk about the reasons for choosing native trees in particular. First of all, they have evolved within our local ecosystem and they have relationships within plant communities. For example, in the forest, trees will be composing the canopy and understory layers and then helping to shade and, uh, and support the shrubs and herbaceous plants in the ground layers. Native plants have also adapted to our local soil and our local water patterns. I just learned this interesting information from a study that was published in Plant, People, and Planet, a study conducted in Houston, Texas. And certain trees were determined to be super trees as far as their help in mitigating climate change. The green bar shows the level of carbon sequestration. The purple shows the reduction of those air pollutants that I referred to, those gases and particulate matter. They also help to mitigate floods and reduce the urban heat island effect. And the trees that are native to our particular area are the American sycamore, river birch, tulip tree, and red maple. And I'll be describing several of these a little bit later. Very importantly, native trees also support our local wildlife. And just as one example, let's look at the tulip poplar, Liriodendra and tulipifera. Hummingbirds, ruby-throated hummingbirds are attracted to the flowers for the nectar. Squirrels and other mammals may eat parts of the flowers. The foliage serves as nourishment for the caterpillar stage of butterflies and moths. And it supports, for example, uh, among the 50 species, Eastern tiger swallowtail, the Promethea and tulip tree silk moth. So in other words, this tree is acting as what's referred to as a larval host tree. Birds like cardinals, finches, and chickadees enjoy eating the seeds from the persistent Samaras. And yellow-bellied sapsuckers enjoy feeding on the sap of the tree. And because of its large size, it can also provide cover and nesting. Entomologist Doug Tellamy has noted that certain trees, certain native trees, uh, are what he refers to as keystone species. And that is because they are especially supportive of large numbers of the caterpillar stage of those Lepidoptera. And that's important because the caterpillars um, are in a sense at the base of a food chain and they in turn will support multiple species including numerous bird species. Chickadees pictured here for example need to feed between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to their young during a, a span of time, 16 to 19 days when they're in the nest. The caterpillars are very easy food uh, for those young birds to consume. The white oak pictured here is among the most supportive of the keystone species. And in a study conducted by Dr. Talamy and Associates, 
it was shown that yards with 70% of native plant biomass would be able to sustain these bird populations. And of course, woody plants, of which trees are the primary example, those are going to give us the greatest biomass in any individual location. Talking about appropriate native plants, uh, in Virginia, we're very lucky, lucky. We have a great variety of native flowering plants. Uh, and that is because we are at the southern end of the mid-Atlantic species and the northern end of the southeastern species. Looking uh, from east to west in Virginia, it's divided into three ecoregions, the coastal plain, the Piedmont, and the mountains. And here in the Arlington Alexandria area of Northern Virginia, where I'm speaking from, we're right along the fall line. So we locally can take advantage of plants uh, from both the coastal plain and the Piedmont. Now, during the course of the talk, I'll be indicating which plants also are adapted or have a, na a na native range, uh, both in the mid-Atlantic and maybe into the Southeast and perhaps even across um, Eastern North America, up into Canada and uh, up to the Mississippi River. Before I start introducing the selected species, I wanted to mention that you can follow along with the a two page handout, the first of two handouts that uh, I've sent your way. Uh, the first one will have a list of all of the trees that we're going to be discussing. The common names and the scientific names are provided. Now by taller trees, I'm referring to the trees that are going to be up in the canopy of a forest and those may be the taller trees in the understory. So those that are maybe 40 feet and taller. I'd also like to mention that if you refer to that handout, you will see that there are, uh, most of the, of the tree names are underlined. That means that there are links that should take you to the tried and true fact sheets that Colleen referred to a few moments ago. So looking just at this first uh, example of a plant, you'll see lots of text information, but you don't need to be copying this all down because this is reproduced on the, the fact sheet. Uh, you'll also notice that I'm providing information here about the, uh, the range of the plant. And many people are interested in various uh, conditions and whether a tree might be uh, resistant to, to deer. So those particular characteristics will also be noted. So our first tree, the tallest of our trees will be going from the tallest to the shortest in each category. The first is the white oak, Quercus alba. This is prominent throughout Virginia, the Mid-Atlantic, and Eastern North America. It's a majestic deciduous tree uh, up to 80 feet in height and even wider in its spread. It has a massive trunk and very strong horizontal branches. It's slow growing, but very long lived. It can live over 400 years if well sighted. This tree prefers full sun and dry to moist conditions. And as you see, it tolerates um, many conditions, black walnut, clay, drought, and dry soil, but it's intolerant of flooding. This tree is very supportive of wildlife. It provides food, cover, and nesting sites. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, it's the larval host for many Lepidoptera species, making it number one in Doug Tallamy's keystone list of woody plants. White oak has four seasons of interest. Right now, you'll be seeing the catkins. These are wind pollinated rather than pollinated by insects. It has these distinctive leaves with the rounded lobes and very deep sinuses. Acorns with bumpy caps uh, ripen in the fall. The trees will be, begin producing these at around 40 years of age, so it takes a while. And they have a very beautiful red fall foliage that will actually linger through the winter. As far as planting and care, you'll, this is quite a large tree, so you'll want to leave adequate room and plant it when small to accommodate the roots. It's best to provide a rich acidic soil, well drained to avoid root rot. And you'll want to mulch to the drip line of the tree, that's the end of the branches, that will eliminate compaction and competition with any surrounding grass. 
and unfortunately, you'll want to uh, protect uh, saplings from deer predation. So this is a forest canopy tree in its natural uh, situation. It can be used as an ornamental lawn tree for fairly large landscapes. Uh, should you not have room for the white oak, there are several more that you might consider. Uh, the first is red oak, Quercus rubra, not quite as tall and wide. This tree is a faster growing tree, but not as long lived. Maybe 250 years would be the maximum life of that tree. A slightly smaller tree, also fast growing, is the willow oak, Quercus fellows. And this tree prefers moist to wet locations. It tolerates pollution, making it a good street tree. And here's a look at the interesting willow-like leaves. If you don't have room for either of those, you might want to consider the dwarf chinkapin oak, Quercus prinoides. This will grow only 12 to 25 feet high and wide. It prefers dry to moist conditions. In fact, it tolerates poor soil. And this tree will actually begin producing acorns around three to five years. Our next tree is river birch, Betula nigra. This grows in the coastal plain and Piedmont regions of the mid-Atlantic and also grows into the Southeast. It's a deciduous tree with multiple trunks. I personally find the trees with three separate trunks the most balanced and attractive. It reaches about 50 to 70 feet in height. And uh, the, the numbers here, the first numbers are the height and the second numbers are the spread of the tree. This is a fast growing tree. And as you can see, it has a fairly irregular crown. It grows in sun to part shade and definitely prefers moist to wet, humus-rich acidic soil. It tolerates, again, a range of conditions, but this tree is intolerant of shade. Deer rarely damage it. It attracts birds to its seed and is the larval host for 413 Lepidoptera, making it number four on Talamy's keystone list of woody plants. River birch is a tree with four seasons of interest. You'll be seeing the catkins right now in April. It has these very attractive oval to triangular leaves in the growing season. But its most outstanding feature is this exfoliating bark that peels away in papery layers of multiple colors. And it's beautiful even in the winter time. When planting and caring for this tree, you'll want to site it uh, ideally in semi-aquatic conditions. And if not in those areas, you'll want to think about providing supplemental water during periods of drought. You can use bark mulch to help keep those roots moist. I would ur uh, strongly urge you to site the tree away from any paths and driveways. I found by experience that this tree tends to drop a lot of litter of very small twigs, which constantly need sweeping up. You'll want to avoid pruning the tree in the spring when the sap is running. And this would be an ideal substitute for paper birch, which has a much more northerly range or the invasive weeping willow. As I mentioned, it's best suited to semi-aquatic conditions, so you could use it as a specimen or in small groups um, in large rain gardens, along ponds or stream banks to control erosion. If you don't have room for the straight species, you might consider Little King, a cultivar that's only eight to 10 feet in height, and this would be a great choice for a container or a cart courtyard planting. Our next tree in height is sweet gum, liquid amber sterescent flua. This is found in the coastal plain and outer Piedmont from Delaware south to Virginia and even a little further south. It's a tall, straight trunk deciduous tree ranging in height from 60 to 75 feet. It's rapid growing, but also long lived and adaptable. Another tree that prefers full sun and it also likes moist, wet, acidic conditions. It in fact will tolerate short duration periods of flooding, but it's intolerant of shade and pollution. Deer will occasionally severely damage the tree. This tree provides cover and nesting sites as well as food for songbirds and small mammals. 
and it's the larval host plant for the Luna moth. Another tree with multi-season interest, it has these beautiful glossy star-shaped leaves, and you'll see it in a range of fall foliage color from golden through oranges, reds, and even purplish tones. Sweet gum has these interesting corky wings to its branches and very distinctive woody seed capsules. They begin green and will mature to brown and actually remain as an interesting ornamental feature on through spring of the next year. It's best to plant this tree in the spring to allow it recovery from transplant shock. Many trees do well when they're planted in the fall, but this is one that does best when planted in the spring. It's also susceptible to iron chlorosis in soil that's too basic. That means soil that has a pH above seven, which is neutral. You'll want to allow plenty of room for root development. And because of those seed uh, capsules, those uh, so-called gumballs, you'll want to site this tree away from pedestrian areas. The fruit can cause litter and some human safety problems. Uh, tripping. Now, I wanted to mention that if you have the room for this tree and you can plant it away from either sidewalks or driveways, I would encourage you to go with the straight species of the tree. There are cultivars, and I was encouraged by a landscaper to use um, rotunda loba. These are trees that have rounded lobes to their leaves rather than the characteristic star shape. And uh, although it doesn't have the fruit, it also does not have those interesting uh, leaf shape and it has a, a very unappealing fall color. So uh, you may want to go with the straight species if you have the room for it. Uh, this would be a great substitute for invasive Norway maple and you would use it as a shade tree. Our next tree is bald cypress, Taxodium disticum. This is found primarily in the southeastern and Gulf Coast and up uh, along the coast in the mid-Atlantic region. It's a deciduous conifer, hence the uh, reference to bald. It reaches 50 to 70 feet in height and is quite a long-lived tree. It grows in sun to part shade, another tree that prefers moist to wet conditions. In fact, it tolerates flooded conditions, clay, strong winds, and air pollution. And I just learned that it is actually one of the few trees that will remain unscathed when we have heavy winter storms that we just recently experienced here in Northern Virginia. And this is because of its flexible branches. Deer seldom severely damage the tree. It provides food and nesting sites for wildlife and is the larval host tree for the Sphinx moth. It has very interesting characteristics, a trunk with a flared or fluted base. And in wet conditions, you'll see it develop these knobby knees. Uh, some horticulturists believe that these structures form as a way to provide oxygen to the tree uh, in these heavily watered areas. It has a very interesting fibrous bark. And right now you'll begin to see this very soft, uh, light green feathery foliage appearing on the branches and it will turn orange to cinnamon uh, in the fall color before the needles drop. It has these green wrinkled cones and they will mature to brown when this, uh, they open to reveal the seeds. This tree, despite being associated with coastal locations, actually tolerates a wide range of soil and moisture conditions. For example, the picture right here shows the tree uh, in our Glen Carlin demonstration garden, which is not by any body of water. Uh, with this tree, you'll want to be alert for more acidic soil conditions. Alkaline soils will cause chlorosis. This is a low maintenance tree with very easy fall cleanup with when the needles drop. It may sometimes develop knees in the lawns, but they won't be anywhere near the height that they develop when they're beside the water, maybe just an inch or so. And you would need to be aware of those when you're uh, using a lawn mower. You can use this as an ornamental lawn tree, uh, especially near water in wet areas or in the center of very large rain gardens. Moving down in height, 
is red maple, Acer rubrum, found throughout Virginia, the Mid-Atlantic, and Eastern North America. In fact, it has the greatest north-south distribution of all the tree species of the East Coast. It's found uh, from Eastern Canada all the way down to Florida in the south and west to Eastern Texas. It has a rounded crown. It reaches 40 to 70 feet in height. It's a very fast growing tree and very cold hardy. I've just recently learned that it may be either monoecious, that means having male and female flowers on one tree, or dioecious, having two separate trees, male and female trees. It can grow in sun to part shade and moist to wet soil conditions. It's referred to as a generalist species because it tolerates a wide range of soil, uh, can handle wet soil as well as air pollution. Deer may occasionally damage it. This tree provides food and nesting cavities and is the larval host for moths, including the imperial moth, making it the number one keystone woody species. You'll be seeing red and female flowers very early in the spring, starting around March here in Northern Virginia. And this is an important early nectar source for bees. Birds will enjoy seeds from the paired winged Samaras and the leaves are three to five lobes with roughly toothed edges. And of course, we're all familiar with their brilliant fall foliage. This is a tree that you'll want to avoid planting near sidewalks or driveways due to its shallow roots, which can cause buckling. And I've learned from Scott Aker, the uh, head horticulturalist at the National Arboretum, that this tree needs early attention to pruning to develop a good branch structure and the important central leader of the tree. Uh, you also need to be alert that wind and heavy ice may break branches and the thin bark can be easily damaged by impact from mowers and weed whackers. Foresters, at least in our Northern Virginia area, have noted that this particular tree is really uh, overplanted in the home landscape. And they urge people, if you're looking for a new tree to introduce, to perhaps consider planting other species. Although we have to admit that it's hard to resist using this as a specimen tree when it takes on this glorious fall color. Our next tree is Eastern Red Cedar, Juniperus virginiana, found throughout Virginia, the Mid-Atlantic and Eastern North America. It's a columnar evergreen conifer reaching 30 to 50 feet in height, another long lived tree that grows at a medium rate. And this one is usually dioecious, separate male and female trees. It prefers full sun and dry to moist soil conditions. It tolerates a, a wide range of conditions, drought, heat, wind, salt, pollution. In fact, it's the best, uh, has the best drought tolerance of any conifer that's native to the East Coast. It is intolerant of wet soil. Deer will rarely damage it severely. This tree provides food and cover for wildlife. Eastern red cedar is a tree with four season interest. You'll see dense scale-like foliage and this lovely silvery bark. In spring, the, you'll see the female cone-like flowers, pale blue in color, and the smaller male flowers. And then the pollinated flowers on female trees will result in this blue fruit. This a tree is easiest to transplant when it's small because it develops deep roots. It's tolerant of a range of soil types and pH, but you'll want to site it away from the alternate hosts for cedar apple rust. Those are plants that are in the rose family, such as serviceberry, quince, and crab apple. And this would be a great substitute for Leland cypress and can be used as a specimen or screen. Next is black gum, Nyssa sylvatica, another tree found throughout Virginia, the Mid-Atlantic and Eastern North America. It's another deciduous tree with a variable shape, 
30 to 70 feet in height. It is dioecious. It grows in sun to part shade and prefers moist to wet soil, although it can tolerate drought once it's established. A deer will seldom severely damage it, although they may browse on the twigs. This is a, a wonderful tree for wildlife support. Its flowers attract bees. It offers fruit for birds. Uh, as a mature tree, it will offer cavities um, and dens for nesting habit, habitat. And it's the larval host for several moths. The floral nectar from the spring blooming flowers is the source of Tupelo honey. And here's a look at the bluish fruit on the fall uh, on female trees. Has brilliant fall foliage. This is a tree to site carefully, allowing room for growth. Apparently it is somewhat challenging to transplant. It prefers moist acidic soils, but as I mentioned, can be adapted to drought when uh, it's established. In fact, it uh, will tolerate poorly drained soil and even standing water. As I mentioned, it's a dioecious tree, so it will need a male pollinator tree for fruit set on the females. And it's a great substitute for white mulberry invasive tree. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have it introduced in my garden here. Uh, I'm intending to use it as a shade tree, although I don't have a lawn. It can also be used uh, as a rain, uh, a tree, a large tree in a rain garden or for erosion control. And it's also appropriate for woodlands. Moving down in height, uh, we get to American persimmon, Diospyrus virginiana. This grows from Southern Pennsylvania south in the mid-Atlantic and then west across much of the Eastern United States. It's a deciduous tree with a narrow silhouette. So though it reaches 35 to 60 feet in height, it could fit in uh, a somewhat smaller yard. It's usually dioecious. It prefers sun to part shade and dry to moist soil and tolerates a range of conditions and is moderately deer resistant. The flowers of this tree attract numerous bees and butterflies. The fruit, the persimmons are enjoyed by many wildlife uh, members uh, as well as humans. And it's also the larval host for the Luna moth. This is an ebony family member and it's known for its extremely hard wood. These fragrant flowers appear in late spring the fruit actually ripens for many months. You'll begin to see it green, small and green in June. Then through the season, it ripens and it actually requires periods of cold and freezing before it's fully ripe in mid-November. The fall foliage is usually a yellowish green color. This is a tree that you can allow to grow either as a single specimen uh, in that case, you would want to remove any root suckers, or you could allow it to spread through those suckers to get a naturalized effect. Female trees are needed for a male pollen, uh, but needed by, a, a, excuse me, female trees need a male pollinator. The fruit is quite astringent when green, but it's very sweet when it goes through the ripening stages. And the fruit can be used in syrups, jellies, ice cream, cookies, and pies. So it has both ornamental features and can produce an edible food crop. Sassafras, Sassafras albidum, is found throughout the Mid-Atlantic and much of the Eastern United States. It's a deciduous understory tree, 35 to 50 feet in height. It has a somewhat irregular trunk and a flat topped crown. Another tree that's dioecious. It grows in sun to part shade as an understory tree and dry to moist soil. It tolerates clay soil and drought and be alert that deer may browse the twigs and foliage. It's an early nectar source for bees and a larval host plant for Lepidoptera. Here are the spring flowers we'll begin to see soon in the spring. It has uh, 
separate male and female plants, as I mentioned. This is a look at the fall fruit, and sassafras is also noted for its aromatic bark. It has three distinctive leaf shapes, the rounded leaves, mitten-shaped leaves, and trees with uh, uh, leaves with three lobes. It has very distinctive bright fall foliage. This tree uh, needs to be planted with care because it has a large taproot. And as I mentioned, it can spread and colonize through suckering. So you would remove those suckers if you wanted it to grow with a single trunk. You can use it as a lawn specimen or as a, a colonizing specimen, grow it as a screen in spacious areas. Eastern hop hornbeam, Austria virginiana, is a tree that many folks are not that familiar with. It grows uh, naturally in the mountains and Piedmont region in Virginia and throughout much of Eastern North America. It's a deciduous understory tree reaching 25 to 50 feet in height. It has a rounded top and slender branches. It's slow growing and adaptable, growing from uh, in part shade to full shade, dry to moist conditions. It tolerates clay and rocky dry soil, but it's intolerant of both flooding and salt, moderately deer resistant. This particular tree attracts the downy woodpecker and purple finch for its nutlets, and it's a possible larval host plant. This is another tree with four season interest. You'll see the spring catkins now, then these interesting serrated leaves that will have a yellow fall color. Very distinctive fruit resembling hops appear in July. And it also has exfoliating bark covering extremely hard wood. This can be transplanted either bald and burlap or from a container, uh, best in early spring. You'll want to mulch and water it until it's established. Uh, after that, it's a generally a low maintenance tree that's resistant to many urban stresses, except for the de-icing salt that I mentioned. And it's a great choice as an ornamental lawn tree, a street tree, or as a, an understory tree in a woodland garden. Next is uh, American holly, Ilex opaca. This naturally grows from Southern uh, Pennsylvania South in the Mid-Atlantic, and it's found in the coastal plain and Piedmont in Virginia and down throughout much of the Southeast. It's an evergreen tree with a pyramidal shape reaching 15 to 40 feet in height. It's slow growing and dioecious, grows in sun to part shade, and moist uh, acidic soil, deer will rarely damage it. This tree provides cover and nesting sites for birds and uh, 18 bird species consume the fruit. Another plant with four season interest, it holds on to its spiny leaves for several years. The uh, flowers in late spring are rather uh, inconsequential, but then it develops into beautiful berry-like droops that are, will be present on the tree from October into the winter months. This tree tolerates clay soil and some shade. In fact, it uh, benefits from partial afternoon shade uh, in the summertime. If it's planted in full shade, it will become a bit leggy and there'll be less foliage density. You'll also want to protect it from winter wind. Remember, because it's a dioecious species, that you'll want to have a male tree available blooming at around the same time as the female within about 200 feet. If you don't have room for both male and female trees in your yard, if you're lucky enough to be, uh, if your property is up against a, a wooded area, you may count on pollen being carried from the male trees in the woods to your female tree in your garden. This can be used either as a specimen or a tall hedge in large yards. Why don't we stop here for some questions, Colleen? The little king cultivar of the river birch, does that have the same wildlife value? 
yes, my understanding is that uh, in every other way, it's, it's as beneficial. It's just had a modification to a height. Uh, with, with many of our species, we really want to go for the straight species, but, but there is the recognition that in some yards, we just don't have room for the straight species. The main effect that would happen with adjusting the species um, of woody plants would be for birds that were looking for berries uh, at a certain height. Okay, uh, just a late breaking question. Someone asked, are there any recommended smaller cultivars of the American holly? The one cultivar that I'm aware of is actually significantly smaller. It's uh, called, I believe, Maryland Dwarf that actually has a shrub-like height. It's going to be more like three or uh, four feet in height, but otherwise it has all of the same characteristics, the flowers and the fruit of the tree, but it's, it's going to have um, a spreading habit rather than a tree-like habit. Okay, um, someone asked, how far away from an Eastern red cedar do members of the Rose family have to be to be safe? Our extension agent says that, that the disease can really spread over quite an area. I think she mentions even, even a mile. Uh, so it, ideally, it's, it's best to keep them separate. The, the rust disease isn't going to uh, destroy the, the plants that are affected by it, but it does as, uh, create a, a rather un, unsightly uh, growth on the fruit. And I'll be showing that when I get to one of the smaller trees that can be affected by the rust. Okay. There were several questions on uh, willow uh, trees. How are they invasive and are they invasive everywhere? Okay. Uh, the trees that uh, I was referring to are the non-native species of willows, the trees that are either from Asia or from Europe. And in addition to the tried and true fact sheets on our Master Gardener website, I have created a set of fact sheets on invasive species. These Salix species, Babylonica is one of them. I don't remember the other scientific names of, of the invasive species. They're considered to be invasive right here in Northern Virginia, but I believe uh, throughout other parts of the United States. They have multiple problems. They have a root system that's shallow and can actually become involved in, in um, the foundation of homes and, and the plumbing system. Uh, they also, they just do much better in very expansive areas, um, such as uh, beside a pond or a stream. Another problem with those non-native species is they do a lot of dropping of branches and the seeds um, can fall into water and be carried long distances and thereby increase the invasive spread. Now, native uh, willow trees, the salix um, species, I'm not recommending uh, in the talk today, although I do discuss them in one of my other talks, one on uh, keystone species. And that again is because they tend to do better away from home, uh, house locations, better by streams um, in a riparian setting where they're going to help control erosion. Uh, the, the native Salix species are very valuable for wildlife. They're um, right up there, very high, right beneath the Quercus species as far as providing support for our Lepidoptera. Great. Okay, and the uh, final question for this group, um, someone comments that the woods in their yard are full of holly trees, but none have berries. Can they all be males? I, I, guess, that's the, <laughs> I guess that's the possibility. The, seed, the fruit, the seeds from the fruit must have been carried from somewhere. Now I'm wondering if maybe uh, with some species, uh, sun is needed for the best fruiting so I don't know if they are understory species in a heavily uh, shaded area, whether maybe the, the trees just aren't getting, uh, getting enough sunlight for the fruit to develop. Okay, thank you, Elaine. We can get back to your talk. Okay, thank you very much. We'll be moving on now to some selected shorter native trees. And these will be trees, again, uh, 
ranging uh, from tallest to shortest, beginning with trees uh, just under 40 feet in height. The first is Coxpur hawthorn, Crataegus cruscalli. This is found in scattered areas throughout the mid-Atlantic and eastern United States. It occurs naturally in the mountains in Virginia, but it's infrequent eastward, although it is native uh, to several counties in northern Virginia. This is a small rounded deciduous tree about 20 to 35 feet in height. It has a short trunk with distinctly horizontal branches. It prefers sun, full sun, and dry to moist soil. It tolerates drought and pollution and uh, be alert that deer may browse its twigs and leaves. This tree attracts native bees for nectar, songbirds for cover and nesting materials, as well as the fruit that develops. And it's also a larval host plant for quite a few butterflies. It's number 12 in the keystone plant species. Coxpur hawthorn has four seasons of interest. You'll see these spring flowers coming along shortly, April to May. Then the fruit will develop. You'll see this uh, green in the summer and it will take on this reddish orange color in the fall. And the haws, that's the name for the fruit, actually persists through the winter. Be alert, this tree has thorny branches and it also has very interesting exfoliating bark. Obviously you'll want to cite it carefully due to the thorns and another tree to plant away from cedar trees to prevent the cedar apple rust. This is a tree that you could prune in winter or early spring. It's used here uh, in the home of a, a master gardener colleague as an ornamental accent and it can also be allowed to spread and form a barrier hedge. One of my favorite smaller trees is American hornbeam, Carpinus caroliniana. This is found throughout Virginia and much of Eastern North America. It's a deciduous understory tree, 20 to 35 feet in height. It has a very attractive globular shape and it's shown here with a single trunk, but it can sometimes be found with multiple trunks. It's a slow growing tree that prefers understory conditions of part shade to full shade and moist, rich, acidic soil. It will tolerate flooding. Be alert that deer may eat the leaves and twigs. This uh, in some studies has been shown to be the most climate adaptable of our native trees. Birds enjoy nesting in the forked branches and the dense crown, and they also enjoy eating the seeds and buds. And this tree is a larval host to butterflies. Another tree with four season interest, you'll see these nutlets inside leaf-like scales uh, fall through winter. Uh, in the fall, also this attractive fall foliage. And its most interesting feature that obviously shows in the winter time is this distinctive muscle-like fluting on the trunk, leading to another uh, alternate common name, muscle wood. Here's a look at the attractive winter silhouette of the tree. This is another of the species that's best to plant in the spring because of its lateral roots. It does well in slightly acidic sandy or clay loams and prefers soil with a high organic matter content. It does well as an understory tree in heavy shade. In fact, it's sensitive to drought, heat, and soil compaction. You might consider this as a substitute for native ash trees that are now being threatened by the emerald ash borer. It can be used as a lawn tree as long as it's in shade, uh, naturalized in the understory, and especially along streams or ponds. And it's especially attractive when grouped. Our next tree is fringe tree, Cynanthus virginicus. This is found throughout Virginia and from Southern Pennsylvania south down through the Southeast. Another deciduous understory tree, this one reaches 20 to 35 feet in height. It's dioecious and as you can see here grows with multiple trunks. It's fairly slow growing. 
It can grow in a wide range of light conditions from sun, part shade through to full shade, like moist soil, but be alert that deer may severely damage it. It attracts bees to its flowers, birds and mammals eat its fruit, and it is a larval host for sphinx moths. Leaves begin emerging in late spring, and then you'll see these fragrant flowers from May through June. Olive-like fruit will develop on the female trees. The male flowers are considered to be somewhat showier. I've had a difficulty distinguishing the difference between the male and female flowers. This tree tolerates clay soil and air pollution, but it's intolerant of extended periods of drought. It seldom needs pruning. It has a very attractive shape. And although there had been some initial concerns in speaking with one of our master gardeners, who is also a tree steward, she tells me that it doesn't appear to be troubled by the emerald ash borer. This would be a great substitute for invasive calorie pear. Can be used either as a specimen or in groups and is lovely at the edge of woodlands. Of course, we want to mention our flowering dogwood, Cornus Florida, which is the state tree of Virginia. This is found throughout the Mid-Atlantic and much of Eastern North America. It's a deciduous tree, pyramidal to flat topped in shape. It reaches anywhere from 15 to 30 feet in height and is distinguished by its graceful horizontal branching. It uh, grows officially in sun to part shade, but I consider it an understory tree and find that it does much better when it has at least partial shade. It prefers moist, organically rich, acidic soil. It tolerates clay soil and black walnut, but deer may severely damage it. It attracts small specialist bees and fl uh, native flies to its flowers. Birds and small mammals will eat the fruit and it's the larval host to the spring azure. Flowering dogwood is noted for its showy petal-like bracts. They can appear as a creamy color here or in pink. And the true flowers are actually rather insignificant. All the members of the cornus species have leaves with these curving veins. And you'll see ovoid fruits along with bright fall foliage. Unfortunately, flowering dogwood is susceptible to anthracnose when it is under stress. And luckily, uh, a native, uh, naturally occurring cultivar, Appalachian Spring, has been found, uh, along with several others, to be a disease-resistant cultivar. This tree, as I mentioned, performs best in part shade to avoid creating that stress from drought. Uh, it's a good idea to site it where the foliage won't remain wet and to provide good air circulation because another disease that has been found to, to affect the dogwood is um, powdery mildew. And that will be a concern in conditions where there's high humidity. You want to mulch flowering dogwood to keep its roots cool, provide uh, excess water, supplemental water during drought. And this is a great substitute for the non-native Kusa dogwood. It can be used as a specimen, especially near patios, and is very effective when grouped at a woodland edge. Another lovely understory tree is Eastern Redbud, Circus canadensis. In Virginia, this grows in the mountains and Piedmont region, as well as throughout much of Eastern North America. Another small deciduous understory tree reaching anywhere from 15 to 30 feet in height. It has a short trunk and an umbrella-like crown. Unfortunately, this is a fairly short-lived tree, only living about 20 to 40 years. It grows in a range of sun conditions, full sun to full shade, prefers moist soil, can tolerate clay and black walnut, but deer may often severely damage it. 
This is an early nectar source for butterflies and the seed pods that develop are food for birds. It's the larval host for Henry's elfin and the io moth. Here's a look at the beautiful pea-like blossoms that appear from April to May. They're uh, blooming right now here in Northern Virginia. And you'll note this interesting characteristic, color, uh, colorfury. This uh, means that some of the buds will actually appear directly on the trunk and the branches of the tree rather than just the branch tips. Eastern redbud has heart-shaped leaves with smooth edges. And these are the seed pods that will develop in May and last through to December. It's a good idea to plant the trees when young. It, uh, they have a deep taproot that's going to make transplanting difficult. You also want to avoid siting the tree in wet or poorly drained soil. Partly shady locations are best in areas that have hot summers. And you can keep the tree vigorous by regular watering and careful pruning. This would be a wonderful substitute for the invasive mimosa tree. You can use it as a specimen, lawn, or patio tree. And it also is lovely in natural settings and woodland margins. Pawpaw, Asamina triloba, grows in the coastal plain and Piedmont regions in Virginia and uh, from Southern Pennsylvania South. It's also uh, appearing scattered throughout the Southwest, excuse me, the Southeast and West to Missouri, uh, Arkansas and Louisiana. It's a deciduous multi-stem tree, 15 to 30 feet in height with a short trunk and a suckering habit. It grows in sun to part shade and prefers moist to wet soil, tolerates wet soil and black walnut and deer uh, rarely damage it. This particular tree is pollinated by native flies and beetles. Birds and box turtles enjoy the fruit and it is the larval host for a variety of Lepidoptera. Pawpaw has very interesting bell-shaped flowers uh, purplish brown in color with uh, a somewhat unpleasant scent, hence the attraction for the flies and the beetles. It has very large tropical appearing leaves, six to 12 inches in length. Pawpaw has uh, this lovely fall color and it is the native tree with the largest edible fruit fruit that can be eaten not only by wildlife, but enjoyed by us as well. The fruit measures three to six inches in length. It um, is said to have a somewhat tropical taste, a little bit like banana, mango, and citrus, and it has a custardy texture. The fruit will ripen in late summer to early fall. This particular tree does well in naturalized riparian or woodland areas. As I mentioned, it's rhizomatous. It's going to form what are referred to as clonal colonies. And that means that all of the trees are going to, to be related to each other. This tree is not dioecious, but you're going to need uh, saplings, seedlings of different genetic strains in order for productive fruiting to happen. And uh, some horticulturists mentioned that they actually use a paintbrush to do hand pollination of the trees, but the trees need to be of, of different genetic backgrounds. This is one tree that you'll, you'll want to avoid planting near sidewalks or patios to prevent the mess of any fruit dropping. You can use it as a fruit tree or in butterfly, pollinator, and rain gardens. Downy serviceberry, Amelanchia arborea, grows all the way from Maine down to Virginia, throughout Virginia, east to west, and also scattered throughout the southeast and somewhat westward. It's a deciduous understory tree, 15 to 25 feet in height, and uh, is a multi-stemmed species. It grows in sun to part shade, prefers moist soil, and will tolerate clay and dry soil as well as pollution, and deer seldom severely damage it. 
This is a wonderful early nectar source for native bees. The fruit uh, is attractive for the birds and it's a larval host for a variety of butterflies and moths. This is another lovely tree with four season interest. You're seeing early spring flowers like this right now uh, here in Northern Virginia. This edible fruit will develop in May. It has brilliant fall color and then this very attractive dappled bark that is lovely in the winter. Some planting and care tips for downy serviceberry. Again, a, a species not to plant near eastern red cedar or the prostrate junipers. This is what the fruit looks like when the, the rust uh, affects it. Downy serviceberry will flower and fruit more prolifically if it's located in sunnier sites. And you would want to remove any root suckers to allow for greater growth. Another great substitute for invasive calorie pear. This can be used as a street tree beside patios, as well as in woodland gardens. Another uh, dogwood is pagoda dogwood. Cornus alternifolia. This is found in Northern Virginia and the mountains of Virginia uh, throughout the Mid-Atlantic and in Northeastern North America. It's another deciduous understory tree, 15 to 25 feet in height. It's flat topped with horizontal branching that uh, appears in very distinctive tiers, hence the common name pagoda. It prefers part uh, to full shade and moist acidic soil. The picture shown here, the tree is actually uh, beside my home, but it's up, up been planted on the north side of the house, so it has plenty of shade. It uh, does tolerate a bit of sun from the, in this particular location, as well as light shade, poor soils and clay. And unfortunately, deer may occasionally severely damage it. Pagoda dogwood attracts many pollinators, including a specialist bee. The fruit is used by 43 different species of birds, and it is also the larval host for the spring azure butterfly. Unlike other members of the cornice genus, pagoda dogwood has alternate leaves, although they may appear to be whorled at the uh, ends of, of stems. And here's a look at the attractive maroon fall color. Pagoda dogwood has flat fragrant flowers. They'll be coming along in May. Fruit is eaten readily by birds in June. And then you'll see these lingering red fruit stalks. Pagoda dogwood is interesting because the bark on the young trees is green. You'll want to plant pagoda dogwood very carefully because it has a shallow root system and moisture is vital for its long-term survival, especially if it's sited in any amount of sun. You can do this by uh, mulching to keep the root zone cool. You'll also want to protect it from wind and ice because of that delicate branching. This is a great substitute for the non-native kusa dogwood. You can use it as a specimen along shaded water's edge or in woodland gardens. And our final understory tree is Sweet Bay Magnolia, Magnolia virginiana. This is found in the coastal plain of Virginia and along the coast all the way from New Jersey down to Louisiana. This is an evergreen to semi-evergreen tree. With the harsh winter that we just had locally, uh, the tree did lose most of its leaves. Uh, it grows only 12 to 30 feet in height, another multi-stemmed species with an attractive rounded crown. It grows in sun to part shade and prefers moist to wet, rich acidic soil. It in fact will tolerate occasional flooding and even some salt. Deer ap apparently damage it more on the southern end of its range. Birds and other wildlife consume the seeds and it's the larval host to swallowtail butterflies and moths. Taking a look at the four season interest, you'll see shiny green foliage, 
these lovely lemon scented flowers from May to June. They will develop cone like fruits that will mature late in the summer and then reveal bright seeds for birds and other wildlife. And the tree also has attractive, smooth, lightly scented bark. This tree does well in clay soil and even tolerates wet and boggy soil. It's sometimes referred to as swamp magnolia. It's best established in part shade in the spring or the fall, and you'll want to uh, provide continuous watering and mulching to help it establish. You can use the uh, persistent fallen leaves as a mulch unless they are diseased. They are, are somewhat leathery. And this would be a great substitute for the much larger Southern Magnolia that can really overwhelm some of our small landscapes. This tree can be used either as a specimen uh, in foundation plantings as shown here, in wet areas or in large rain gardens. Do we have any questions about these smaller trees, Colleen? Someone wanted to know what should they do about rust on their downy service berry? Is there a treatment or should they worry about it or should they replace it or? Uh, I will be preparing what I refer to as an addendum document that will be sent out to everyone who has been attending today. It will also be posted on our Master Gardener website along with the recording of this presentation. And in that document, I'm going to share more detailed information of, about the rust disease. There are treatments, but they would be very involved and need to be used over a long period of time. So although it can be somewhat unsightly, it's really best if you have planted the trees that uh, will have this, this common disease in, in uh, affecting both of them. Just to, uh, just to let it be. As I mentioned, it's not going to destroy the tree. It's just going to make the, the fruit a little unsightly. Okay. And uh, two questions about Sweet Bay Magnolia. Can, the, can it be grown in the Piedmont area? And is it resistant to deer? We need to be aware of the fact that when hungry, if deer uh, are heavy, have a heavy population in any area, there's really no tree that's safe. And that's why I've, I've tried to signal which ones are the, the most affected. Um, the tree uh, does do well in our uh, Piedmont part of uh, Northern Virginia. It, it just natively grows, uh, its native range is in the coastal plain. Someone asked, they have a dogwood tree that has damage from a sap sucker. Is it a home for these birds? Hmm. Uh, I'm not aware of that, but I will look into that and uh, respond in my addendum document. Okay. Um, another question, any advice on finding a male or female tree when purchasing? I don't, that followed on the Sweet Bay Magnolia question, so I'm not sure if they're referring just to Sweet Bay Magnolia or if they... Okay, it's probably referring to, to any of the dioecious species. They, um, it was some of the larger trees that I mentioned, like, uh, like the hollies, for example, that, that are dioecious. Um, ideally, the, the nurseries will be marking the trees as to whether they are, <clears throat> are male or female. One thing you could try to do would be to purchase the tree at a time when it's either in flower or ideally would be fruiting. And you could see which of the trees in the nursery had the fruit um, and, and which ones did not. If they did not, that's not necessarily an indication that it's a male. Now I found that some of our native plant nurseries are going to be more interested in carefully marking whether the trees are male or female. And I'll give a little more information about sources of native plants um, in just a few moments. Okay. Um, did you mention the expected lifespan of a dogwood tree? Uh, I did not, and I will double check on that. I believe it's somewhat longer than that of the eastern red bud. Okay. There was a second question about sap suckers. Is there a way to um, discourage them? 
Uh, let me add that uh, along with the other question uh, to research a little more thoroughly so I can, can give a good answer to that. The, uh, the tulip poplar, uh, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that attracts that particular bird is, is such a large tree, it's not likely to, to be uh, terribly affected. But I'll look into this question a little bit further. Um, talking about the, the lifespan of the dogwood, uh, I've had a tree that I planted that's already well, well into getting on to 40 years. Wow. Um, but I'll, I'll see if I can find out the, the, the full lifespan expectancy. Okay. And someone asks if pruning the shoots of a service berry will encourage more shoots to grow from its base. Uh, any kind of pruning is probably eventually going to mean that more, it's just the natural growth habit of the tree that they will tend to, to send more of them out. But it's, it's easy enough just to, to clip those easily at, at the base anytime you see them appearing. And some people actually like the, the multi-stem variant of, of, the, of certain trees. Okay, uh, no more questions, but a big thank you for your tried and true native plant uh, series. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. Those were developed, the very first generation of those fact sheets um, was developed back in the summer and fall of 2013 in anticipation of a half day symposium that was held in Arlington and Alexandria. And every year, uh, a Master Gardener colleague, Mary Free, and I uh, look and determine which additional plants we'll want to include. So uh, look for that collection of plants to expand over the years. All right, uh, I'd like to conclude by giving you a briefly some general information on planting and care of trees. First of all, we want to site trees properly. They're going to be long lived. They're a very important uh, member of our, uh, of, of our landscape. Uh, so first of all, you'll want to consider the relationship of the tree to the house planted within a certain distance. Uh, you also want to keep in mind uh, and avoid any overhead or underground utilities. There are certain recommendations as to how far apart trees should be planted, large trees about 35 feet apart and smaller trees about 20 feet apart. And uh, another very important consideration is allowing room for root expansion. Uh, in the past, pictures of trees, cutaway pictures represented a tree, a tall tree above ground and a great deal of growth below ground. That is not an accurate representation of trees. Most of the roots of a tree will grow just within the top several feet of soil. They will then send out lateral roots and those can reach not just to, to the drip line, the end of the branches, but actually well beyond that. So you want to avoid this kind of a, a situation. Of course, you'll want to follow the principles of what master gardeners refer to as right plant, right place. Before you even think about introducing a tree, consider exactly what the sun and exposure will be, what the available moisture levels will be naturally, uh, do a soil test and determine the, the soil type and, and the soil pH, how much uh, organic matter you have in your soil for those species that especially need that. Uh, consider exposure to wind and salt, especially if you're next to a roadway. Uh, another important consideration is avoiding competition with lawn. Turf grasses and trees really have very different uh, requirements, especially with regard to pH. And uh, the pH is associated with different bacterial and fungal growth. I mentioned that uh, early on when I talked about the, the soil. Grasses will grow in a, a close to a neutral pH of a six to seven, but trees on the other hand uh, are much further down uh, on the level of acidity. They prefer uh, a soil pH uh, lower than seven. 
and they are, they, as I mentioned earlier on, they tend to be associated more with um, the, the mycorrhizae, those fungal associations, rather than um, the naturally occurring bacteria in the soil. There are also problems when fertilizers and herbicides are applied to lawns. They can be taken up into the roots of the tree and affect them uh, negatively. Lawns, uh, especially if we want to keep them emerald green, have certain watering needs that may not meet the, the needs of a particular tree. And trees can also suffer damage from weed whackers and uh, mowing. One very important topic uh, to maintain the health of your tree is to mulch trees properly. Let's look first at the benefits. Uh, mulching reduces the soil moisture loss. It will insulate the soil and protect the roots of your tree. It improves soil structure, drainage, and fertility, especially when you use uh, organic materials. And it's going to reduce the likelihood of damage from those uh, weed whackers and mowers. As far as the types of mulch, you can choose a wide range of organic materials, leaves, shredded bark, wood chips, or pine needles, but definitely avoid landscape cloth and newspaper. Those are not going to allow moisture to flow through adequately and uh, especially will, will inhibit the, the natural gas exchange between the atmosphere and the roots. As far as the technique for mulching, you want to mulch six inches away from the trunk flare, that naturally occurring widening uh, at the, the base of the, of the tree where the, the roots will begin growing. You want to mulch all the way to the drip line in different directions and mulch shallowly and evenly, only th two to three inches deep. You definitely want to avoid these mulch volcanoes. You don't want the tree to appear like a telephone pole coming straight out of the mulch. Um, this is causing several problems. First, it's going to retain moisture up next to the bark of the tree, possibly causing fungal infections. And the roots will be encouraged to grow up here above the soil rather than going down deep and be, being able to, to uh, access the deeper uh, levels of moisture. You can also use plants as a green mulch and then not have to worry about reapplying mulch around the tree, uh, the leaf bark or chip mulch uh, from year to year. It's also important to water our trees sufficiently. You can use irrigation bags as shown here for newly planted trees. And beyond that, you want to provide an average of 20, uh, 15 to 20 gallons per week during the growing season for the first three years of a newly planted tree's growth. And of course, be alert for periods of excessive drought and continue watering your tree. Uh, you want to water infrequently, but deeply, about half an inch of water per session. It's best also to avoid sprinklers so that you don't have the disease of the, the moisture adhering to the, to the bark of the tree and possibly causing burning of wet foliage. As the tree continues to grow, you'll want to continue your care. Uh, I strongly advise retaining fallen leaves. Leaves are not litter. They're a, a rich source of nutrients that can be taken up again by the tree and by any surrounding plants. It's a natural mulch and it's going to uh, disintegrate over time with the interaction with all of the microbes in the soil. And also very importantly, we're now learning about how important maintaining those fallen leaves, that leaf litter is to overwintering insects. There are um, insects in all stages of life. Um, the early stages of our uh, fireflies and many of our moths and butterflies, they will be overwintering in that leaf layer. Uh, above ground, you want to be worrying about some of the invasive vines like uh, English ivy here in our region. Uh, they are going to reach up into the trees and strangle them. They're going to cover the branches and block photosynthesis and the heavy weight of those uh, vines may actually break tree branches. Uh, I'd like finally to mention a few important resources. 
there were uh, so many native trees that I, I can't discuss them all today, but these additional native trees are discussed in uh, a recording of another presentation I gave recently, the keystone species of native plants. And of course, for all of the trees, um, there are these fact sheets that are going to provide all of the information that I've given you today, plus uh, additional points and lots of great photos. I'd like to recommend uh, a recording of a class that was presented by my master gardener colleague and the head of our public education team, Amy Crumpton. This was a, a presentation given fairly recently, Native Trees, Selecting, Planting, and Transplanting. And she goes into much greater detail about all the proper ways to cite your tree and the ways that it can interact with other uh, layers of, um, of your plantings in the yard to benefit wildlife. Uh, this is a, a, a website, Plant Nova Trees, that is particularly pertinent in our Northern Virginia area. But I think those of you attending from uh, outside our region would also find it very helpful. Plant Nova Trees is a five-year campaign that has just started to help build the canopy in Northern Virginia. But you'll find lots of information on the value of native trees, how to go about rescuing them from invasive vines, tree planting tips, and uh, further information on some of the species I've mentioned today, plus many others. Locally, there's a wonderful website by our Arlington Alexandria tree stewards, and you'll see articles on uh, pests that might be eventually affecting our trees, uh, important information on how to plant and care for trees, and again, further information on how to remove those choking vines. The Trees Are Good website, uh, again, has further information on both planting and caring for mature trees. And that's a, a site where you can find a professional arborist to give you information on caring for your tree. As far as obtaining native trees here locally uh, in Northern Virginia, I invite you to check out on our website under the programs menu tab, our small trees make big canopies program. This is a uh, a way that you can get free trees. These are trees that volunteer in the homes of our master gardeners and other friends. Uh, the trees are potted up, rescued, nursed along, and made available for free at different events here in Northern Virginia. Some of us are also lucky enough to have programs like uh, Eco Action Arlington that offer trees. They're free trees and they actually are planted for, uh, for residents through tree canopy funds. And also for those living in Virginia, I invite you to look at the Plant Nova Natives site under native only sellers, a great source of, of sellers, both in Northern Virginia and further afield in our state. Today's presentation has been uh, brought to you both by Virginia Cooperative Extension, our Arlington Alexandria unit, and by Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. And we invite you to consult with us on any other gardening questions at our help desk and our plant clinics. We have uh, quite a few demonstration gardens. You can see the locations of those on our website and uh, can come and visit and see some of these native trees uh, in location. Any final questions, Colleen? Um, there are no final questions, but I think you will be delighted to read all the many thank yous for your most excellent, dense, information dense, beautiful picture dense presentations, Elaine. Thank you very much, Colleen. You're <laughs> welcome, everyone. Uh, I, I hope today uh, I've given you at least a, a few suggestions about trees that you might want to consider adding to your home landscape, or it will help you understand the importance of uh, preserving native trees in our natural areas and encouraging their planting in, uh, in our cities. So happy gardening to all of you until we see each other again. <laughs>